Hey, I'm NC from Bantu Mile Hill at Mahalia's Corner. I am here in the city of Bridgetown, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and I am about to go on a journey with historian Carl Watson to learn more about our nation's capital. Hi, Carl. Good morning. <laughs> Lovely to see you. you nice, too. bright morning. It is. It I'm is. not a morning person, but yeah. I got out of bed just for you. Same. <laughs> well, good. So we're on the same wave like. Okay, so you can tell me. Like, we right here near to the screw dock, but you can tell me a little bit that oh, yes. you might We're not know. Okay. All began because geography and history and heritage go together. Exactly. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the geography of the area and what made it so important and why this particular area of Barbados was chosen to become our capital city, Bridgetown. Okay. All right. Let so me do it. So shall we walk out here and take a little look on the beach? We shall. And it's a beautiful beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in the Caribbean. It's actually my favorite beach. Well, you know, I come from this area. I come from the Bailan. Ah. And as children, we would go down where the Esplanade was, or Bronx Beach. Mm -hmm. But it was totally different in my childhood to what it is today. In my childhood, none of this existed. Okay. This beach wasn't here. And in fact, if you went to the Esplanade and stood up on the edge, where there's a beautiful long beach today, mm -hmm. if you stood up on the edge when I was five years old, the waves would break over the edge and douse you. Oh, wow. So you had to be very, very careful. Oh, gosh. So this bay provided a relatively safe haven for vessels coming in. Mm -hmm. When you set up a colony, the most important aspect of any colony is trade. A colony is set up to make money for the mother country. Okay, so that meant that ships came in here. And of course, you had to protect the shipping. Right. So where the Hilton is there over there, you can see a fort at the very end of the little peninsula there. Right, that's and, Charles Fort, And right? that's Charles Fort. All right. And over here on the pier head, mm -hmm. that in the 18th century used to be called the Mole Head, there was another fort, Fort Willoughby. That one I didn't know about. Because the base of it is all hidden on the concrete today. Okay. And then on the other side is James Fort. Okay. So Bridgetown was protected by three big forts. And then where Burke's Beach is, you also had a battery, like a small fort, if you care to think of it that way, called okay. Ormond's Battery. Now, did these forts see any action? Did Barbados ever face any invasion or potential invasion? Did we? I think we did. Yes, a lot of people think not, but you are correct. We did. Right. Um, back in 1650-51, when Barbados declared itself its first independence, mm -hmm. a very short independence, remember when the Barbadian planters and merchants of the day did not want to remain under England under the control of Cromwell. So they declared that Barbados was an independent country. And what did the English do? They sent in a fleet and an army to fight Barbados and to bring it back into subjection mm -hmm. as a colony. So the English fleet came in here and there were a lot of Dutch vessels. You see this is a clue to it. The Dutch were very important in Barbados's early development. And so the Barbadian merchants and planters of the day wanted free trade. They did not want trade controlled by England. They wanted to be free to make their trading arrangements with whoever they chose to do so. And the Dutch, as I said, very influential. So there were 14 Dutch vessels in here and they were all seized by the English. Right. So Barbados was eventually fought into subjection and the famous Charter Barbados. Mm -hmm. We never became a crown colony. We never ever were a crown colony, but we did in 1652 surrender um, and became once again under the control of England. Just a couple years later then, because of laws put in place called the Navigation Acts, which worked against the Dutch, a famous Dutch admiral, the most famous admiral of Europe of the time, a man called De Reuter. De Reuter. And in case you have no idea 
what De Ruyter looked like or who he was, I can show you very quickly. Uh, Here yeah. is Admiral De Ruyter. Okay. And it's a representation of the battle. There was an enormous sea battle wow. that occurred here in Carlisle Bay. Yeah, this is like Bacchanal. Oh, more than Bacchanal, let me tell you. But a lot of people died in it. Oh, God. And, you know us Bajans, we're not easy. <laughs> so we defeated the right. And look, we actually printed what was called a broadside because okay. we didn't have a newspaper. So we would print things and circulate them. So this is the routing of the Reuter or the Barbados bravery. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. we always used to big up ourselves. Yeah, man. Nothing wrong with that. We, we big it up ourselves from from long time ago. <laughs> we may be a small nation, but we consider ourselves we are the equal of anybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of it is really, I mean, it says here that um, before Isle, thou camest with great bravado. But we had boards enough in Barbados, and men that made it to thy teeth appear, there was no planting for a Dutchman here. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. We, we beat off, right, right we beat off Europe's greatest, most important Admiral de Ruyter. Incredible. And then, fast forward nearly 100 years, 1764, and this site, this bay, was also the scene of a very, very important issue in navigational history. Okay. And again, this is an article. That, this has come from the Journal of the Barbados Museum. Okay. The source for anything anybody ever wants to know about Barbadian history and heritage is in this journal published since um, 1932. Okay. Where be able to get? Where people will be able to get? Oh, you can you can buy this from the, the bookshop of the, the Barbados Museum. Museum. Awesome. Yes. Now. <laughs> There was a big puzzle in the 18th century. Ships out at sea, out of sight of land, had to determine their position at sea. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you had to calculate using two lines that crossed each other, latitude and longitude. longitude. Mm -hmm. They had a pretty good idea about latitude, but longitude was difficult to calculate until this man here, William Harrison, invented a chronometer, a special nautical chronometer that was accurate at sea. Mm -hmm. You see, there were clocks that people could use and give you estimated time at sea, but there was no accurate clock until this man invented this clock. And it had to be tested, a warship called HMS Sterling sailing here in Carlisle Bay with the clock mm -hmm. on board. And this other man, masculine, who was the rival of Harrison, met him here. He favored a method using the, the moon, mm -hmm. lunar calculations. And he said that Harrison's method was a waste of time. There was a big prize at stake, right. 20,000 pounds, which back then was a couple million Bajan dollars. <laughs> right. So it was a lot of money, you know? And the two of them were fighting tooth and nail over it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Harrison won the day. So. There was actually years gone by a brass plaque in the, in the ground here, and I think it's all been covered over. Oh dear. I hope one day somebody with a metal detector can find it uh, and, and it. show it again, or uncover it, exactly. Yeah. But <clears throat> there was that, that brass plaque that commemorated the, the, the landing of the, of the clock, mm -hmm. the watch. And if you ever go to, to London, it is uh, that particular chronometer is on display in the Royal Maritime Museum okay. in London. <clears throat> so, we're gonna walk up here. Now, as an archeologist, I can tell you, what is on here is really interesting. You see over there by that mile tree, the Casuarina tree, mm -hmm. this whole area used to be Fort Willoughby. Right. And beyond was a series of reefs. And in the 18th century, all the town people of Bridgetown it became like a landfill. The House of Assembly said, all the old garbage you bring down here and dump, we're going to reclaim the land. Okay, so that's how that started? So that's, that's how, how that this started? area became reclaimed, yeah. Because before then, it was like a series of exposed reefs right. at low tide and so on. So this built up and eventually became 
the pair had. When I was a child, and you, you travel through the islands mostly by schooner or, or motor vessel, or if you cross the Atlantic, mm -hmm. you came in on steamship. You would always come ashore here because that's where the baggage warehouse was located, and that's where you would land, okay. get checked by immigration, and your baggage would be brought ashore. Uh -huh. And then the, the Carina itself was filled with schooners mm -hmm. coming up from all the islands. As so, a child, that was something that I enjoyed. Seeing the, the schooners? Well, seeing the schooners come in, but more importantly, seeing the women from Dominic and St. Lucia <laughs> stepping off in their national costume. Uh, that was something that was very unusual for a child and something I enjoyed. Right. Now, you were going to ask about these things like yes, steaks sticking up. Yes, I was. I was up. going to ask about these. Very important question, and I'm glad you brought that to my attention because that is the screw dock. Right. The last remaining wooden screw dock in the world. Okay. There was one in Hong Kong as well, but that was destroyed to make room for airport expansion. Mm -hmm. Now this, sadly, as you can see, is looking rather run down. And I hope that funds are found to, to restore it to some degree. It'll never work again, mm -hmm. but with COVID, I think so much of our, well, important aspects of our heritage and so on, monies have been spent on more important things in the, in the short time. run. Yeah. So a lot of these have sort of like lapsed, as it were. But let's hope that brighter days are lying ahead for us. Mm -hmm. Hope so. And I hope that we can conquer this pandemic and then get back to things like protecting our heritage. That's true. So what, what, is this, what was the screw dock used for exactly? Yes. Now, vests, including big vessels, would sail in here and you can't see them but they're wooden arms under the water mm -hmm. and these like um, poles these metal um, poles sticking in the air the screws are all attached with screws and a machine here would elevate the ship by raising the arms mm -hmm. and lifting the ship clear of the water so that then workmen could go and do any repairs clean any barnacles that were on the hull. Okay. If anything needed painting, it could be painted and other repairs that were necessary. Now we're gonna walk up here and I will relate to you a very tragic and sad aspect of our past. You know, history deals with the good, the bad and the indifferent. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna look now at aspects of the bad and what I'm talking about is that where those buildings are located, part of the Massey complex. Mm -hmm. This used to be the location for what in the late 17th, early 18th century was a large holding area or barracoon, one could think of it like a barracks. Okay. That was set up there by the Royal African Company so that West Africans who were captured and brought across the Atlantic in the slave trade, destined for re-export to Spanish America, mm -hmm. would be held here to recover from the trauma and the rigors of the passage across the Atlantic. I see. No, many died. You know, the, the shipping was horrendous and people were literally packed by like sardines yeah. on the vessels. You yeah. crammed us because people were making money off of selling other human beings. Yeah. And so the more you could get on a ship, the more money potentially you could make. And people weren't thinking about the health and the well-being and the psychological impact. They weren't thinking about any of these things. All they were thinking about is making money. money. So that's generally here was the barcoon. And men were working doing some excavation for an extension. And I got a call that said that they had recovered bones and I thought probably these were camel bones or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I came down here with a student then, I was mentoring, an American student, and we saw that they were all human bones. Oh, wow. So when the work stopped, 
we went into where they were digging and we, we went to the point I had reached. And we noticed that because you go down five feet here and you're in white, white beach sand. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that it was a strange red line in the sand. And when we looked carefully, we saw little fine copper nails. Okay. So we realized that this was the lid of a coffin and the copper that doesn't um, decay over time, like if it was iron, mm -hmm. it would have oxidized and rusted yeah. all away. Mm -hmm. So we dug around and we recovered the complete skeleton. And this was interesting and frightening. It was late in the evening, the sun was going down, it was starting to get dark. And I was digging, with, because we archeo archaeologists use Mason's point and trowels. Mm -hmm. So I'm digging around the skull, and my trowel just touched his skull, and it rolled, and as it rolled, puffs of green smoke came out the eyes and the mouth and the nose. Green smoke. Green smoke, yeah. And I was terrified. I, I screamed out so loud. <laughs> it heard me all the way back to the bay land. Oh my and gosh. And I, I dropped everything, and Fred was also frightened, and we ran and ran away. But then we went and bought a bottle of white rum <laughs> and came back and poured it as a libation okay. to calm down the spirits. Yeah. And then we went down and we recovered this individual. Well, <clears throat> forensic examination showed that this was a young woman, an African woman, probably between the ages of 20, 25, around there. And she'd been buried with what we call grave goods. Okay. One was a long smoking pipe. People used to smoke very long pipes back then. And they'd bought a brand new one and put it in her hand, put her hand across her bosom, and as the body decomposed, the pipe fell through the rib cage, okay. and it was completely preserved. So that was with her, a big, big, big door key, mm -hmm. a brass pendant, which must have been attached to a leather um, necklace that, that rotted away over time, um, bits of uh, particular glass bottle that had gin or liquor in it, called the onion bottle. And the last thing, a shark's tooth. Okay. You can interpret these as you like, but I think the key was a symbol that you could open the door to eternity, mm -hmm. the supernatural world. The pipe because everybody smoked, the bottle because everybody drank liquor, mm -hmm. the pendant because that was personal decoration, so I'm very personal to the individual who died, and then the shark's tooth, I think, signified that that individual had survived the Middle Passage only to die here and be buried here. Sounds like it made sense. Um, but it was a very, well, let me say, not only frightening, but, but tragic to, to recover yeah. these aspects. Now, the examination, the skeleton showed that she did not die of any physical trauma. There were no broken bones or shattered or fractures or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Her dentition was very good. We know she was a woman because of her pelvic area. We know about aspects of her health because, as I said, her dentition was good. She probably died of one of the many gastrointestinal diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, a little bit of personal family history. You. The cables have obscured it. But over there where those cables run, you're going to see this signpost that says Cavens Lane. Lane. Mm -hmm. So there's Cavens Lane. Now, this is where a little bit of my personal family history comes into play. Who was Caven? My mother's family name is McCleary. And in the late 1790s, around 1800, a man called Michael Caven, who started a business here, brought three nephews from Scotland and they were McCleary's because his wife was a McCleary. Mm -hmm. So I descend. So this the man that had this business here around 1800 would have been my great uncle about six times removed. Yeah. So we're going to walk up to the Independence Arch that was put in place after independence and then um, refurbished mm -hmm. and it contains mementos and aspects relating to the commemoration of independence. 
So that was put up there, sort of like the equivalent of Roman triumphal arch. Okay. Um, this I have been led to understand was done more at the request and direction of Cameron Tudor, who a lot of people don't think too much about him today, but... I was going to say the name doesn't even sound familiar to me. Well, I know for a lot of my students at university, they have no idea who Cameron Tudor was. I found that remarkable. He was a very important force in Barbados' early political history. And he was like the power behind the throne in many ways. He had a lot of good ideas and so on. So we cross the swing bridge and look at the most iconic view of the Eastern Caribbean, looking towards the House of Parliament, the old House of Assembly. Mm -hmm. And we look at the clock tower. When this was first built, there was a much larger and taller clock, clock tower on the other side. But because this entire air bridge down used to be a mangrove swamp, mm -hmm. the tower started to sink. Oh, and so had to all take of this it. was mangroves? Yes, all of this was a big mangrove swamp. Even in my childhood, when Queen's College was still where the dame, Elsie Payne, education, Minister of Education. Believe it or not, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, there were mangroves, a mangrove swamp still there. Okay. And it was all canalized and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, if we cross over here, there's an interesting little story I will tell, again, taking us back to the time of our independence. This is reclaimed land. You can see the capstans there because this was the inner basin of the Carinage. Well, let me ask you a question now on camera. What do you understand by careen? Uh, movement, the fast movement forward, I think. <laughs> yes, you can talk about children careening their way. Yes, but there's also a nautical aspect there. Okay. Careen I mean, from, I would assume so, but I, I don't know what Careen from the French um, term, it derives from a French word. And really and truly what it meant was to turn a sailing vessel on the side and to scrub the hull okay. and clear it of terrata worms and barnacles and so on. Learn something today. So vessels were careened here. Okay. This was, as I said, filled in to create a one the magnificent Satra Earl Barrow over there. Well, at independence, the then morning. good morning, the most famous singing group at the time, the Supremes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I've heard of this Came story down, there was a raft yeah, here, yeah, yeah. and the Supremes sang, you know, all their famous songs, Stop in the Name of Love, and you name it. And they were having a wonderful concert until I was down there that night. And people started pushing at the back and pushing yeah. and pushing. I heard, yeah. And then a struggle broke out and some bottles were thrown, unfortunately. And they had to like, like take them away and, and all that and they, stuff, right? Uh, brought an impromptu and quick end to the concert. That was very disappointing. Oh, gosh. I have a story with the Supremes, but I don't <laughs> know if I can tell it on camera. Off the video, they're off the record. It is interesting. <laughs> no personal experience. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay. I, I used to swim for Barbados in my youth. And I swam illegally in the Hilton pool. Oh, dear. And one morning, I went up, early morning, like this time a bit earlier, swimming, and these three girls came down to the edge of the pool, and they were looking at me swimming up and down, and one said, whoa, you can swim really well. So I said, well, can't you all swim? Why don't you all come and swim with me? <laughs> and they all said, oh, we can't swim. So they came in to me, and the first one put her hand and said, hi, I'm Diana Ross. Oh, wow. And then they all introduced themselves. So I said, look, Who's going to volunteer to come in the water? And I'll teach you first. I'll teach everybody else. So Diana said me. And she jumped in. And I was holding her like that in my hands, telling her, move your hands and kick your feet. And then I'm going to move my hands slowly. And don't think you're going to sink. If you think you're going to sink, you'll sink. Right. If you just ignore it, you'll float. And as that was happening, I heard a loud shout. <laughs> Diana, get over there right now. And when I looked, there was this guy coming down with a big beach towel, 
and he was clearly not pleased. You're right. And Mary Wilson whispered in my ear, you're in trouble now. <laughs> That's Barry Gordy. Oh my God. And he doesn't like anybody around Diana. Oh. So she got out of the water and went off and <laughs> left me with the other two Supremes who I gave swimming lessons stuff. Wow. That's my Supreme wow. story. <laughs> that, that is, that's a good story. You should, you should write that. And it all began that right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the swing bridge, now again in my childhood, this had a different configuration. Yeah. And the bridge moved in to allow vessels to come in to the inner basin. Instead of, of the, like lifting. Instead like of lifting, which it does now, yes. Now, as I said, we get back to geography. This is a tidal inlet, but it also serves to drain water from the, the hills of St. George, mm -hmm. and, and inside of St. Michael, etc. So there are a lot of fresh water springs around. Okay. Because when human beings live, in one area, the one thing that they have to have is uh -huh. access to water. water. Yes. Without water, you have to be nomadic, you have to move around looking for water. So Bridgetown had copious supplies of fresh water, which gave Bridgetown then the lead over the other competing possibilities, Spitestown, Holtown, or Oysters. So geography played an important part in helping to create the avenues for the evolution of our heritage. As I said, this is iconic. Now again, going back to the 17th century, this whole area was called a green. From the English, whenever any village or town was opening up, you would always have a communal space and that was called the green that mm -hmm. people could use. But so people could use it for entertainment, for just hanging out, cooling out. Or it also became an area of punishment. Because in the old days, and I know this is now a bit of gender history coming into play here, mm -hmm. but women for most of human existence, women have been treated as second class citizens. And in the old days, if you had a wife or girlfriend that wasn't listening to you, you would bring her down here. They had a pond and they had a big, like a piece of a trunk or a big extension of wood with a stool attached to it. And it would put the woman to sit down in it and strap her in and then duck her down in the water and keep her down there for about a minute. You blow my cool cow. And <laughs> When they brought her up, they would say, you're going to obey your husband now. Oh my you can gosh. stop talking back to him. And if she said, no, because that man is this, that, and the other, back down in the water again for another minute. That's atrocious. Yeah, no, so, but. That's and, around what, like what time period? 17th century, 1600s, you know? Yeah, but as I said, women on her very recently in the marriage ceremony, it's the woman that said, I promised to obey. The man never said I promised to obey, only the women. I mean, I guess they didn't have a choice. That, that was the vows, you yeah. know. This area has undergone many transformations. What we see here now, the, the beautiful um, neo-Gothic styled um, public buildings, Houses of Parliament, mm -hmm. very interesting on both sides, actually. In fact, I personally prefer, prefer the view from the Palmetto side on the other side. Okay. But before these were, were put in place in the 1870s, there was a whole row of houses here, etc. And the much contested and debated um, Satra Horatio Nelson, which no longer exists, the plinth is there, but that was put in place 1813 when a group of civic-minded Barbadians bought a house and an area, of small area land there. They had public subscription stayed. You can go to the newspaper today and get the names of everybody who put up money 
to buy the land mm -hmm. and to pay for the statue to be sculpted by West McCourt in England. Okay. So was it always here? I, I've heard, I think I've heard people talk of it being on the other end of Broad Street at some point. Oh, no, 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 no. It was always, always here. here. Okay. Um, what was changed was the, the position. I either, looked, I either looked to the east or to the west. Okay. It had been um, moved around. Just reposition it at the top of Broad Street. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the shell fountain over there to commemorate the bringing of water okay. to Bridgetown. I've always wondered if it had a meaning behind it, if it was purely aesthetic. Purely decorative and so on, yes. Yeah. No, it has a very important meaning. Okay. Because in 1854, people talk about the pandemic today. In 1854, there was an outbreak of cholera. And that killed almost 25% of Barbados' population in three months. Wow. In three months, close to 23,000 Barbadians died. To put it into perspective, given the, the change in our population, that would be the equivalent if COVID had killed in three months close to 80,000 Barbadians. Wow. You can imagine what our society would have reacted. Yeah, that must but have been devastating. As a child, I grew up hearing all these stories via my great-grandmother about cholera and they dug mass graves around the island. Wherever you go in Barbados, you will find, once you find a spot saying cholera ground, you know that there are hundreds if not thousands of people buried there, there in a mass grave. Wow. So fresh water, because cholera is a waterborne disease. So that's very important. And then the cenotaph, we often again, youngsters don't know much about World Wars I and II, and the fact that the world was in a, in a terrible state. Turmoil. Where yeah. turmoil, where um, two huge competing blocks were competing for power. Millions of people got killed in both both world wars, and Barbadians were among other Commonwealth citizens or citizens of colonies who volunteered to fight in the war effort. And so that cenotaph commemorates those who sacrificed and lost their lives. I would have seen pictures of the Korean age in the past and it seemed like there was a lot of commerce that happened in this area. Oh no, you're perfectly correct. I can go back and I can tell you my childhood experiences. Right over here, you would get people, mostly women, coming from the country, particularly St. Andrew, where there was a big um, clay deposit and a, and a pottery industry and they would bring down flower pots, connery jars, other um, vessels made of clay and put them up here and offer them for sale. When lumber came in this was filled with large rowboats called lighters okay. and men would row in the lighters laden with lumber. So on that side where that little garden is now in Cars Park, you would have huge stacks of lumber piled up there. And the outer basin of the Carinage, that was lined with um, schooners that had come in, and they would offload their cargo too. And then it was a hive of activity. You had women walking around with containers on their heads, selling mobby, and they were good, I can tell you. <laughs> Without looking, they would say, I want a glass of mobby. And we'll have big glasses. And put the glass, open the faucet, and fill it to a certain point, and then you got a big foaming head. Wow. And that was your, your mobby. That's the women used to, like, they used to balance these things on their oh, heads. Oh, yes. With it was amazing incredible. skill. I mean, in my childhood, almost anything that you had to carry, you didn't bother carrying it in your hands, you carried it balanced on your head. And men would do it too, but women were very, very good mm. at it. And then the hucksters of the day, okay, you had hucksters who specialized in selling vegetables. Mm. But you know, as a child, you're not too interested in vegetables. You want a sweeties. Right. <laughs> so when I came in with my mother or my great aunt, you would go and you would buy a glassy or a sugar cake 
or any of the different homemade sweets. Because it wasn't like today where you went in a specialized sweet shop. Right. You know, it was a cottage industry. And a lot of people made their living from making homemade sweets and selling them. You know, Barbadian women, as I said, women were treated as second class citizens. But the women used their smarts. And when they wanted to make money and be independent to a degree, they would, as I said, do things. Grow some yams and edders yeah. and sell. Innovate. Innovate. Yeah. Or make sweeties and sell in Bridgetown or sell mobby. All of these things women did. Heritage can be broadly described as two main groups. The tangible, like buildings, mm -hmm. that's part of our heritage. But then you have the intangible aspects of culture, mm -hmm. music, etc. Language. Yeah language, all of these things, yeah. For the future, this is what I understand now. Sometimes too, you have to look forward to the future. And very often there's a contest between heritage and preservation and the need for change and, and hopefully development and yeah. progress. So I understand that this waterfront is scheduled for a degree of redevelopment. Now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you, I'm going to put you in my firing line. Why are you doing this to me, Carl? <laughs> that's, 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 a te that's a teacher in me coming out. All right, all right, you all see? right. Uh -huh. <laughs> but of any building in Bridgetown, which one would you pick out as the most meaningful or the most attractive? Or the one that you would like to see preserved? Actually, there are two that there are two. I can think of right now. Which are right the two? now is one, the Old Spirit Bond Mall, which is now a mall, I think, which is just ahead of us. An empty and building. It was it, not a success as a mall. Well, yeah. yeah. And okay. then there is um, the building that the Mutual Bank was in. Ah, yeah. Further down. Well, that's the building that I'm talking about. Okay. That's a very important building <laughs> and one that. It's been empty for some time now. I don't know what inside looks like. It was gifted to the university. Ah, but nothing I did, much hear, has I been did done. hear about that. Nothing much has been done with it. Here's the spirit bond. Now, it's as such I a said, gorgeous building. It is a nice brick building. A lot of the buildings were bricks that were imported, ballast bricks. Now, apart from the balcony, look at that it looks like a little a little room on the roof a little, yeah a little extra a little attic, attic thing. looking yeah. yeah but what do you think these were used for i don't know they're at the top of the building so maybe like to look out to be able to look out on the the water correct Yay! you get an a plus <laughs> <laughs> yes because it was important to see when fleets and shipping was coming in and if it was a commercial thing merchants competed with each other and who saw the fleet coming first had a heads up had, yeah. a, had a head start look this building i look love this there. building as well and that is a recent restoration somebody i well the thorn family with ideas with imagination and with money to do it acquired this building and have made it into a showpiece of restoration and on the skyline looking over there is our favorite building yours and mine now it used to be the Barbados Mutual building yeah Very, such a stately building it's just yes it is stately it's a handsome building and it's one of the really top class buildings in Bridgetown these cannon these are all 17th century cannon. Not many people are aware, but Barbados has the best collection of iron cannon of the 17th and 18th century in the entire world. Really? Yeah, so these are just a minuscule example of all that we have. This one at least can be read. It shows the assemble 
hundreds if not thousands of people celebrating and saying goodbye to brothers, fathers, cousins, whatever, Barbadians who migrated to help build the you Panama Canal. Canal. How old do you think this building is? Whew. When do you think it was built approximately? Can I help you, Carl? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's one of the oldest standing buildings in Bridgetown. Okay. Not as old as the Nichols Building, which dates from the middle of the 17th century, but this is built around 1710, 1715. Really? To a specific style, okay. a Georgian style. Mm -hmm. And there are specific features of Georgian architecture. Those little white blocks that you see at the corner. In the corners, yeah. Those are coins. And then the fan-shaped doorways, central doorways, sash windows. The most famous Anglo-American architect of the 18th century, a man called Peter Harrison, designed this building. Okay. This is one of his four buildings that he did in Bridgetown. So this building, what was, what was this building originally? It was used as a warehouse and a store okay. in the 18th and 19th. And in my time, it used to be called the Costas Warehouse. Okay. But before the De Costas had a building, or had a, had a business rather, it was used for other merchants, for other purposes. Okay. And yeah, we, final point, if we look over here, we will see a potential something waiting to be done. <clears throat> this is a remnant of Marshall Hall. The building that we could see in the distance if with the boarded there. up windows? The building with the boarded windows and the, yes. That is what remains of Marshall Hall, which was a huge theater in the 19th century. Okay. But that could be beautifully restored. Yes. It's magnificent. And we need some theaters in Bridgetown. <laughs> well, we do. I mean, there's been talk ongoing forever of the restoration of, of the, the Empire, Empire. Theater. Yeah. So, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Bridgetown, for all its warts and bumps and inconveniences, is still a very interesting city. It definitely is. We haven't gone to the churches, which are just worth a visit on their own. We haven't seen the oldest building in Bridgetown, Nichols Building. Dutch built building, it looks like a building from Amsterdam, and that desperately needs conservation. We haven't seen the beautifully restored area around the synagogue. That's one of the really top-notch restorations in Bridgetown. And we haven't gone up Nelson Street, we haven't seen the potential up there, we haven't gone on to Bay Street, none of these things. So we'll have to make a date and come back again. Definitely, if definitely. If Nicholas is going to accommodate us, or the BTMI. <laughs> But yes, I would end by saying this. Heritage is very important for a number of reasons. But the most important in my view is that it consolidates our feeling of identity. It gives us a location and things that we can relate to. Both, as I said, tangible buildings and cultural aspects. And without heritage, we're like a ship lost at sea. We don't even have Harrison's chronometer to guide us. <laughs> So we need to preserve our heritage, value it, respect it, love and cherish it. And that's what I want to tell my fellow Barbadians. Our heritage is ours, all of us, and we have to, we may not like aspects of it. We can't reach back and change the past. We can't knock down everything because we don't like what happened. To explain the past, you have to conserve these elements whether they be good, whether they be bad, whether they be ugly, whether they be horrific, oppressive, whatever. The past is the past. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. And you, as the poet said, not a tear can wash out a word of it. Thank you so, so much, Carl. So, lovely walking around. We're going to do another elbow yeah, bump. that's right. We're going to have sore elbows at the end. <laughs> but lovely being with you. Same. Thank you so much for showing me around Bridgetown. Guys. Part of Bridgetown. Part, Part of Bridgetown. Part of Bridgetown. Yeah. And teaching me definitely a lot more about our heritage. And this you will remember who Joseph Rachel is now. I, I will do my best. <laughs> and you will, you will know who Cameron Tudor is now. <laughs> but definitely this book that you that you were giving yeah, me. That's the Journal of the Barbados Museum. That, this is definitely an important book to, to keep.
connected to our heritage, so we should all check it out. Very important. This is MC, this is Carl Watson, and we have been learning some heritage of our nation's capital, Bridgetown.